Hello world and welcome to this edition of Tech on Fire with Blaze. I'm Blaze Stewart, Architect at Winelect, and today we're going to be looking at Azure Functions and Azure App Services. Today we're going to be looking at Azure Functions. Now, Azure Functions are the serverless offering that runs on Microsoft Azure and behind the scenes is using Azure App Services. Functions offer an event-driven programming model for developing applications and doing integrations. Now, there's a lot of confusion about what exactly serverless is. It, as the word might imply, you might think that there's no server involved. Well, truthfully, there is a server involved. The purpose of serverless is not to make things have no server, rather it's to and obfuscate the presence of the server such that when you're writing the applications, you really don't target a particular environment or server that you're going to be deploying to. Rather, you're going to be deploying a environment that is designed to run your application regardless of which server it actually lands on. So the idea of having serverless applications is to deploy an application without having to think about the actual server that's running on. You're not configuring Nginx, you're not configuring IIS, you're not configuring a database. Rather, you're writing your application in such a way where all of that complexity is obfuscated away and really all you do is focus in on the actual function that you're writing and then when you go to deploy it, you're not going to target a specific server and configure that server to run your application. You're going to deploy your code and it's just going to work regardless of what server it actually ends up physically running on. So the idea of serverless is not to get rid of the server, rather it's to remove the server from the equation when you're thinking about writing software. The function flow looks like this. It starts with an event because functions are an event-driven model. It starts with some kind of event. Now that might be an HTTP request, some message gets put on a message bus, something happens in blob storage. There's a lot of other different kinds of events that can happen in an environment. Now the event itself isn't part of the function, rather the event binding is. So whenever an event happens, there's something that's watching that particular environment for that event to occur. And when it does occur, it takes whatever that event is and then wraps it up in an object that is presented to the app in the form of an event binding. And this is how it goes from the event into the application. And this is the layer of obfuscation or the really the layer of abstraction that goes on top of the app that prevents an app from talking directly to a given input is the event binding. Now, once you have the input binding um, in play, then it gets passed off to the app. And this is where you really focus in on writing your own code. So most of the development that goes on inside of writing functions is in this middle box here. The input bindings are mostly declarative or something that you can do through a UI or through a GUI of some kind that you don't actually have to write code for. You can change the input bindings by way of code, but generally speaking, you're not going to be writing input bindings. You're going to be focusing on the app, which is going to receive the input binding. Then once the app has processed that input, it needs to write it out to something. And that is what we call an output binding. Now the output binding is also provided by way of configuration. So in the same way that an input binding is configured by way of a GUI or by way of some kind of IDE, the output binding is as well. And what it does is, is ends up being presented as an object inside of the app as well. And then the app will write to that object. And once the app is done writing to that object, it will take the output binding and then the output binding will process that output and ultimately put it into whatever is going to be receiving that. That could be in the case of an HTTP request, an HTTP response, or if it's something that happens on a message bus, maybe there's an output message bus. The, also the thing with functions is you can have multiple output bindings. So in the event of an HTTP request, I could also do an HTTP HTTP response as well as upload something to blob storage or maybe write something to a message bus or maybe even send an email. All of these various output bindings and input bindings are supported on Azure. Here's a list of the kinds of bindings that are supported out of the box with functions. You can see that you have a lot of different options here. Some are both supported as inputs and others are supported as outputs. And with the combination of different inputs and different outputs, you can mix and match these to create rather robust applications with all kinds of integrations with 
functions. I'm here in the Azure portal. I'm going to create an app service from scratch using the portal, and I'm going to utilize it later on in a code deployment. So I'm going to search for function app, and then I'm going to uh, use this wizard to create it. I'm going to walk through this uh, and to show you some of the features uh, to set and uh, talk through these as I do it. The first thing I'm going to need is a resource group, and I'm going to call it Funky Blaze uh, for this particular function as a nod to Azure Functions, and uh, that way I have something unique as well. And I'm also going to call it call the app Funky Blaze. And uh, that way I have funkyblaze.azurewebsites.net for the URL. Now for the runtime stack, I'm going to select Node.js. Now notice here I can, I can deploy this as code as a Docker container. Function apps aren't restricted to app services. You can actually use function apps in a Docker container and run those in a Kubernetes cluster that's on-premise or in Azure or in another cloud. So the ability to port Azure functions across different clouds is possible, but by and large, it's mostly run inside of an Azure app service. Now, I also have the region I need to select, and I'm going to choose US2, East US2 for my region. Now, on the next tab, I need to create a storage account, and this is mostly used for logging, and I'm going to call this for this one Funky Blaze as well. And I can choose an operating system as for Linux or Windows. There's a licensing costs associated with Windows. Linux is free, so you don't pay for that one. So just make sure that whatever uh, hosting operating system that you choose so is supported by the runtime stack that you're using. And in some cases, it's not going to be both and you're going to be forced to use one or other depending on the runtime stack that you choose. Now, the consumption plan is important here. There's three different kinds of plan types that you can choose with function apps. The uh, first one is a consumption plan. That basically means that you build based on the utilization of your application. So whenever your app is called and it, while it's running and when it's done running, the, the billing stops. So it's only billing while the act, actual app is running. Now, this could be advantageous for applications that aren't highly utilized. So you're only running it maybe on a timer every five minutes. So this would be an ideal scenario for running uh, as a consumption plan. However, um, with a, an application that has high utilization that goes beyond those more sporadic use cases, a premium tier might be the one to choose. Now, premiums uh, is intended for applications that run continuously or near continuously. Now, with a consumption plan, you basically are spinning up a new instance of your application, and it might be in a hot state on the next call, but in some cases it's not. So you are often penalized in a way for a boot up time, if you will, for your application. Well, in a premium tier, you're basically going to have your application running 24, 24 by 7, and that way it's always in a hot state. And this is designed for applications that are constantly being uh, requested. And there's also some additional features with premium, such as being able to attach it to a network as a service endpoint and some other uh, uh, features that aren't available in the consumption plan. Now, an app service plan we've already looked at for app services. Now, what you can do with an app service plan with a function app is you can deploy your function app alongside of another app service in the same app service plan. So it's much like this, like the premium plan, except it allows you to share an app service plan with other app services, even if they're not function apps. So these three options are the kind of plan types that you can have with function apps going from probably least expensive, but also intended for low utilization to the most expensive, probably intended for applications that are going to be running uh, within the context of a larger application, and then premium would be in the middle. Now, with the next tab, I'm going to go with consumption plan for this one. I can set up networking, uh, I uh, monitoring, I, I, and I'm not going to enable App Insights. We're going to talk about App Insights at a later date with App Services, and then tagging. I'm not going to tag it. And once I have this up and running, it's going to validate this, and I'm going to create it and wait for it to create. I'm back here in the Azure portal looking at the resource group that was created when I created my function app. You can see here I have my app service plan. Now this is the app service plan that is the consumption plan I used to create my app service here with. Now I need an app service plan because this is fundamentally an app service that is running my 
function app. Now down here, my app services is actually where my function app is installed and it's got the uh, Azure functions logo next to it. So I still need an app service plan of the special kind for consumption for an app service plan for an app service that's going to be running a function app in the case that I'm using these. And this is a storage account that was created for this. So with that, I'm going to open up my function app here. And you can see here that I have a couple of different options here on the left pane. I have functions, proxies, and slots. This is for deployment slots. This is for proxies, which are basically URL rewrites that you can apply to functions. We're not going to get into that today. And then I have functions. This is the meat and potatoes of Azure functions right here. Now, if I wanted to create a new function, I can either click right here, create new, or I can click this up here. If I want to click on the create new here, I can click choose one of the quick start guides here um, uh, using Visual Studio Code or any, any tool or core. And I'm going to be using this one later on um, when this you can then uh, use the, the tools that you can download and install on your machine or you can create them in the portal. But just to quickly give you an idea what you can do in the portal is I can go to create in the portal. I can use one of these two defaults, a webhook, or, which is an HTTP endpoint, or I can do it on a timer or I can click new new. Uh, and I select one of the templates here and you can see here are all of the input bindings for a lot of the input bindings we saw on the list earlier, such as service bus or HTTP endpoints or things like that. But I'm not going to be using the portal to create this function. I'm going to use the, the tools that you can install on your local box that give you the ability to debug these locally. Now, to get the tools, you want to go to the GitHub repo for this, which is defined right here, GitHub uh, slash Azure slash Azure dash functions dash core dash tools. And what you can do with these is install these using NPM. So this requires that you first install Node.js, or if you have Chocolatey installed, you can install it using Chocolatey using the Choco package manager. And then of course they have them available for Mac or Linux. So this gives you the tools. It'll install them locally on your box. And once you have them ready to go, you can use the CLI to run your function app. Now I'm here in my console and I have a directory I've created called funky blaze. And this is where I'm going to be running my funk command. Now I've already installed the core tools available for windows on my box here. And you can do the same on your box, depending on whatever platform you're using. Now I'm going to type in funk and this is going to list all the commands that are available within the function tools. And I really want to create a, uh, initialized application first. So I'm going to do funk init. And this is going to create some basic files for my application. First, I'm going to choose the, the, the worker type runtime, and I'm going to be using Node.js. So I'm going to select Node here, and it's going to ask me if I want to use JavaScript or TypeScript, and I'm going to use JavaScript. Now, what that's done is I've created some different files that are needed to actually run my application. Now, if I was doing this in an IDE, I would do this through a GUI of sort, and a lot of this would be created on my behalf without having to use the uh, CLI tool. It's going to create the same files, though. So once I have these files created, I can then cry, type in func new, and then this is going to allow me to create a new function. And the new function is going to ask me, what do I want to use for my trigger? And this is my input binding. And I'm going to use a HTTP trigger right here. and um, this will allow me to name it. So I'm going to say get my name and this um, will create a basic function called get my name. So now I have a directory that is going to have all my files in it and my directory is going to let me open this up and pull it over here. This is look, going to look like this once I've created. There's those files I created when I um, uh, ran the init command and here's the actual function that I'm going to be able to run whenever I call this. So if I open this index.json um, up, this index.js, you can see I have a basic function that's going to give me some input bindings and output bindings. In this case, because I'm using HTTP, it's going to automatically give me a input binding, which is an HTTP request. And then it's going to have an output binding, which is a um, HTTP response. And so it's going to be request uh, that query dot name and then re request. And then it's going to have the response right here on the context, which is my output binding. Now with my output binding <clears throat> set, 
within the context of my function. I don't actually have to write any HTTP request. It's going to take that and send it back to the calling application or browser, whatever it might be. Now, this is a very basic demo, but I could change this however I wanted. If I wanted to say hola instead of hello, I could definitely do that and save this. Now, also, there's one other setting that I want to change here. And uh, within my functions.js, you can have authentication levels or authorization levels. And I'm going to change this to anonymous, but I can also have uh, keys associated with my function so that whenever I go to deploy my function, you have to have uh, a key to call this function in, uh, in order to execute it, or I can make it anonymous and anybody can call it. The reason that key is, is available is so that you can have authorization levels to prevent just anybody from calling your function and running up your bill. So when I set this to anonymous, I can now publish this. I can save that file and I can now publish this using the, uh, the func tools here. So if I go func and um, type in uh, the, the actual available commands to me. You see I have Azure as one of these. I have Kubernetes uh, as well, so I can publish these to Azure or I can publish these to Kubernetes. So I'm going to go func Azure and type that in. And this is going to, I can publish, work with a, a storage council or I can do the publish through the function app and uh, function app. And this is going to list me commands here. And here I can say publish or I can look at the log stream or I can get the app settings, whatever, or list the functions available. But I'm going to do a publish here. And to publish it, I need to supply the name. So because I called mine Funky Blaze, I'm going to publish this particular function app to Funky Blaze. And this will go through a process. And we'll come back whenever this finishes. Now that my publish is done, I'm going to copy this output URL right here. And this is that uh, app function app I created with the API slash get my name function. Now I can just simply right click, uh, highlight it and right click inside of this, this console here, and then go back to my browser and open up a new window and paste it in. Now this is expecting a parameter called name, and I'm going to supply blaze to the parameter and it's going to put output at hola blaze because I changed it from hello to hola. And I can use Bob as well, or any other name that is a string. It would just simply return that as part of the output for this particular input. Now, this is a very basic demo, and uh, it's showing you how to create a function app and then how you can use the command line tools to create and then publish a function app through those command line tools. Uh, next time on Tech on Fire, we're going to be looking at some more features related to Azure App Services as we go even deeper into all the things that you can do with Azure App Services. If you like this content, please consider visiting us online at www.wintelect.com and there you can find about services that Wintelect offers, including training and consulting services. Also, please consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the subscribe button and clicking the bell icon to get notifications when new content becomes available and also comment down below. You can also follow me on Twitter at the one mule and also follow Wintelect on Twitter at Wintelect now or at Wintelect. We are constantly posting things about Azure related technologies and things related to software development. You can also reach us by email at consulting at Until next time, thank you.